Welcome to Illo Talk Interviews. I am Corey Kerr, and today I'm interviewing Jason Copeland, professional comic book illustrator, penciler and inker and whatnot, um, the artist behind Pop, Kill All Monsters, and the current running issues of Judge Dredd. And uh, I have volume one of Kill All Monsters right here, and you should actually check out Kill All Monsters and pre-order it on Amazon because the omnibus is coming out, which is like 300 plus pages, and it's pretty sick stuff. If you like giant robots, uh, piloted mech fighting monsters and whatnot, and Godzilla and all that jazz, then this is your bag and you should check it out. Anyway, while we talk, Jason will be uh, mostly working on roughs um, and kind of getting the composition down for some pages for Judge Dredd, and we talk about uh, a lot of like how he does that, why he does that, and certain um, compositional choices that he's choosing, the tools that he uses in his process. Make sure you stick around to the end, uh, or possibly skip to the end, but because uh, about an hour or so into this, we start talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is um, you have to make something, you have to have a passion project, you have to have personal projects and do the work before people come to you. And, uh, and this is exactly how Jason did this, is they were told no over and over and over and over again. They were rejected time and time and time again by publishers for Kill All Monsters. And then they retooled it, and they did it anyway, and they launched it on the web, and they kickstarted it, and it was a huge success. And now that has completely launched his career. And so uh, we talk a lot about, it, about that at the end, and uh, just, just stick around for that because it's totally worth it. It's a pretty good interview, so I'm just going to take you right to it. The Low Talk Interviews. Uh, what, are we, what are we doing here? Are we doing like reps to get ready for a page in Dread? Or? Yeah, you know, uh, essentially, I'm. Um, <laughs> And even my my pen. Well, these are these are technically for me pencils. Uh, uh, so I take something that's like super. Uh, oops, I uh, super super um, like just chunky, super chunky. Yeah. Uh, silhouette type stuff. That's I I try to bang those out. Well, I think about them quite a bit before um, that I go to this next step. But um, and then I just gray them out. And, and then put layers over them and, and sort of tighten it up a little. Yeah. But I don't, uh, this, I mean, this stuff is as, as tight as it's going to get. Uh, and, I'll so, just on these. and so then you'll, then you'll print this out as blue line and ink over the top of it. Or how does, how do you go from here? Yeah, no, that's exactly it. I've got a large format, uh, printer. Yeah. So I can just print these out on boards and, uh, yeah, I'll, pr I'll print, print it out in blue and just ink over top. What are you printing on? What, what kind of printer do you have? Oh, I've got a, I got an HP desk jet something or other. Yeah. I bought that a long time ago and I, I keep thinking it's an Epson. And when I go to buy new ink cartridges, they just look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm looking for an Epson, you know, uh, the cartridges is, uh, now I've forgotten what it is. It's like a, a 67 and the guy's like, oh, Epson doesn't make that. Oh, I'm like, yeah. dude, I've had my, I've had my printer for like five years. I totally know they do. And then I, he's like, well, maybe it's an HP. And then I'll look at the packaging. I'm like, yeah, it's totally. HP. <laughs> That's funny. And you said yeah. you, you said you think about it before you get to this stage. I mean, are you, are you, uh, are, is that a, like a totally cerebral thing? Like where you're just kind of playing it out in your head or do you like, are you sketching it on post-its? Or I mean, what, what, do, what do you mean? What, what happens prior to kind of these roughs digitally? Oh, like the, the super, super roughs. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm curious on, so take, just take me through like real quick, like how okay. you get, how you get to this stage here. All right. Well, I would start with like, uh, uh, I'd start with, um, of course I don't have one, uh, like a blank page. Oh, uh -huh. no, uh, we'll just do this and get rid of all this stuff. Um, but I'll start with a blank page mm -hmm. that's already got, um, the, um, the bleed and stuff. Yeah. So I've got, you know, the live area, the, the trim, and then the, the actual file um, size is the bleed. So, um, and then I'll just, uh, you know, put a layer over top of it and uh, I'll usually, 
I mean, I'll be looking at the script. Yeah. Very seldom will I do little thumbnails on the script. Sometimes I will, sometimes I won't. But generally, I'll have read the script a number of times. And then in my head, just kind of think of how I usually start with the idea of like, is this panel more of a horizontal panel or more of a vertical panel? And then I all just usually just sort of eyeball a certain space that I think we'll need, depending on, uh, you know, the type of dialogue that's in it or, you know, what the action is. If the action is something big, uh, I might think about making the, the size a little bit bigger, that sort of thing. Yeah. And then I just would start drawing, and it's usually fairly big uh, brush. I don't worry too much about details. And it's more like um, just figuring out, you know, silhouettes mm-hmm. and stuff. And uh, it'll be something just super, super blocky if I think that I need to have some sort of background information, whatever. Yeah, I'll do that. And then once I get to a point where I like it, uh, then I go to that step that we were looking at before, uh, just before this one where I'll gray it out mm-hmm. and I'll put another level up on it. Zoom in. Uh, make this smaller and then and then get into more specifics as to what the characters are doing, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and I don't, uh, I don't, like I say, at this level, at this, at this stage, um, I'm not going for super duper gray read, uh, um, uh, detail uh, right, right. and realism. I'm looking more just for basic shapes and um, and you know some faces I'll tighten up, although that's not tight at all. But um, what I'll do is I'll uh, unfortunately I already deleted the stuff that was underneath there. But uh, no, that's uh, fine. But something like that you can kind of see, yeah, like yeah. like the rough of what it is, and then what I decided I wanted to keep. And then once once I'm kind of all right with that, if I want to keep the background levels, then I just will we'll just erase the stuff that I don't want to keep, mm-hmm. and then and then bring back that and keep like the background stuff. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so, so yeah, I would just because again, uh, I don't I'm not usually too worried about the specifics. I worry about all that stuff when I'm actually inking. Because yeah, that's the yeah. fun part. Inking's the fun part. This stuff's tedious. So uh, I'd rather get the basics down and then uh, and then ink from there. So you do you do a lot of the details while you're inking. Then you're 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 solving a lot of those kind of more detailed problems like in ink. Yeah, yeah, that's one reason why if you if you ever want to um, to uh, to buy a stock in anything, you should you should buy stock in whiteout. Because I keep that, <laughs> I keep that company going. <laughs> I, I buy what I buy white out by the box. Yeah, yeah. My pages are like super chunky, um, which um, I'm I'm cool with uh, because it's part of the process and oh yeah, and that sort of thing. But I think uh, <laughs> in my brain when I'm doing it, I'm thinking, oh, I'm such a hack because I look at some of these old um, pages, you know. Uh, from the you know Kirby and all these sort of guys, um, or oh, like I I love buying those uh, artist edition books, and I bought um, I bought the Al Williamson uh, uh, what was it Empire Strikes Back, uh-huh. and uh, so that was like a six issue limited series that they did at Marvel, and uh, so these are uh, full size reproductions of the pages, and I swear to God, uh, he did. I don't know. It was about 200 pages, I guess, in that. Yeah. And I saw white out on maybe like eight pages. Yeah. Everything I, was like exactly what well, what was on the what was on the board was exactly what was penciled. Like it's it's pretty mind blowing, and the the level of uh, skill and craftsmanship in that is pretty amazing. And then I look at my pages, and it's just blah, like it's. If I, yeah, I'm, I'm one of these guys that um, um, I, I put a line down and I react to the line that I put down. Uh-huh. Um, and so each line tends to uh, suggest another line. And sometimes the lines that I put down um, aren't, aren't, they don't work out. So I just white it out yeah. and, and go again. 
Well, you have a you have a lot of uh, I don't know the right terminology, but you've got a lot of fluidity to your style. I mean, you can you can really feel. I mean, there, there are there are a lot of different types of artists, right? And and I oh. mean, you've you've got um, you've you've got a level of kind of action, and you can kind of feel the uh, the movement in it. And it's and it's not that it's not precise, but it's not like a uh, it's not like a like a, a lot of people. I feel like they draw like engineers, you know, where where it could almost be like an exploded engineering drawing, you know, or whatever. But yours. Uh, I feel like has like, it, it has like a movement to it that, that you really feel. And it really helps. I've, I noticed, cause I just reread uh pop mm -hmm. uh, a couple hours ago, kind of in, in preparation for this, but, and I noticed like a lot of that fluidity, even in the direction of the line work will kind of move you from panel to panel in a way that, um, that I don't see, I'll see it compositionally in, in, in other illustrators, but but yours, even like even like the the direction of the of the brushstrokes and things are are helping you flow through the page, which is a really interesting uh, thing because you there's a lot more life in it than than you see in a lot more in a lot of the stuff that's a little bit more precise. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. I think um, I tend I tend to th like yeah. A lot of decisions, like I say, a lot of decisions are being made as I go. So. Um, I don't really, <laughs> it's never, I never really overthink anything because I'm never really, um, I don't, I don't want to be tied down to that one specific line. I used to, um, I used to pencil really tightly uh -huh. and, uh, and, you know, I would get, I would get the page looking, uh, how I, you know, I'll be like, oh, I really like this hand and, oh, I really like this face and, and, uh, this is great. And then I would realize that uh, a large portion of that time when it came to inking, I would just obliterate that perfectly drawn hand or that perfectly drawn face. And I got to the point where it's like, well, why do I stress so much making sure that that hand or that face or whatever is just right when I know that there's a good chance that I'm going to end up screwing it up when I ink it. So, <laughs> uh, so I kind of just cut the middleman out and was like, well, if I'm going to, if I'm going to futz through it, anyways then why get so precious about the penciling yeah so um so you know and now that, that was learned over a course of years uh, uh because i i think that uh i mean i don't want to speak for artists in general i guess but i think that's that there are artists out there and i'm including myself where you have this sort of preconceived notion of what um what finished work looks like or what um what professional work looks like on the page yeah and and that can really cause people to to seize up and and you know be really hard on themselves uh saying oh well, it doesn't look like al williamson you know the way he inks and that sort of thing well <laughs> i got news for you <laughs> there's only one al williamson so and uh so you just kind of kind of find your own thing and be yourself and um and you know just get comfortable you know doing things how you do them yeah. And it took me years to get there. It really had. So. Yeah. I think I'm just coming into that now myself. I, I haven't been doing this for very long, only only a couple of years. But um, I got a master's a little while ago, and I, one of my professors was talking to somebody else in the class, but I had this like huge revelatory moment as he was like, you know, I've watched so many students fight who they are as an artist trying to do like this realistic, you know, rendering yeah. when, when that's not who they are. And I was like, holy crap, you've just described like the last like two or three years of my life. <laughs> and it was like, I, I don't know why we do this to ourselves, but like, it was like, I needed somebody else to give me permission to like, to be, to be who I am. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, Oh yeah, I could totally, stop trying to render things like you know like i've seen people do and just do it the way that i do it yeah and it was it was and after that i really felt like because because prior to that i would get a lot of critique in my portfolio and i heard a lot of people say dude this really looks like like five people did this like <laughs> you, you, you have no no consistency in what you're trying to do like sometimes it's like this and sometimes it's like that it's all over the place but since that moment when I was like, why am I trying to, 
you know, be somebody else. Uh, and I, I was able to relax. And now, now all my stuff is starting to look like I made it rather than like, you know, and I, and I think I've heard, you know, most people go through this stage where, you know, you kind of start off and you're, you just don't know what to do other than just rip people off. And then you eventually evolve. And, and it's so freeing to get to that point when you're like, I, I don't know why it sounds so stupid saying it out loud, but you're like, I'm, I'm just going to do this like I do it, you know? And then, and then all of a sudden you're, you're, you like level up and you're like, Oh yeah. Okay. Now I, I get what's going on now. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I was a, I was a John Byrne clone for a really long time. Uh-huh. Uh, because, um, because I, and to me, uh, the way he did faces and things like that, and, uh, was just the way I thought comic book artists should do faces. Yeah. And, uh, so I would, I mimicked him for years. Like that's before I became, you know, even remotely professional, but sure. as I was learning to draw, it was like, Oh, this is how John Byrne draws this, or this is how John Byrne draws that. And, and I would really try to go for that and emulate that. And it, yeah, it definitely took a number of years before I realized, you know, there was other ways to draw things. And, uh, you know, besides the way John Byrne draws them. Yeah. So, uh, but art school was another one of those things that, uh, helped yet hindered me, uh, cause they drove the whole idea of doing comics, uh, out of me because it was one of those, oh, well, that's, that's for, you know, that's for kids. That's not high art. That's not worth your time sort of thing. And how long ago was that? Oh, well, to date myself, <laughs> uh, that, I went to art school. Oh, I, I took six years of post-secondary education um, over the course of eight, well, nine years. There was a, a gap of a couple of years in between um, because I, to, uh, to quote a, <laughs> a, fellow, a fellow artist who dropped out, I was disillusioned by the whole um the whole art school process, uh, yeah, the hierarchy and the blah blah blah, how great painters are over uh, drawers and things like that, and just a bunch of bullshit. So, right, I um, I can swear on here, right? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, good. Um, it was just yeah, it was just one of those things where it's like I don't, uh, I didn't want to fight. Um, <laughs> when you're in art school, you just after a while you just you give up you give up the fight and so i stopped drawing comics uh by my second year and then um decided that uh art school really wasn't for me and i left and so i did music retail for a couple of years and then realized that if i didn't go back to school um i was going to be stuck in music retail forever yeah so uh i went back to school and i did it's funny because I was going to a college that essentially would give me a degree uh, when I started. And then I decided instead of going to like Emily Carr, which was the equivalent of the school I was going to before, I decided to go to a community college. And I took the two-year program at the community college. And I learned more uh, at the community college in that first year than I learned at two years at art school in Calgary. And uh so it was a really good experience to not be part of the art school tradition. And and was that just because, and I have some massively huge biases that I know are about to come out, but is that just because at the community college, there wasn't kind of that intellectual elitism and that, and that like that weird hierarchy that seems to show up in the fine art world or, or what do you think was the difference that gave it that that's like the most loaded question I can ask, but what what do you think the the difference was that gave it kind of a better experience than what you had experienced? I I think you pretty much put your finger on it. I don't think um, the teachers that I had um, were really good. Mm -hmm. um, they were practicing artists, which helps um, which helps a lot. Yeah, but you know they didn't. Uh, they all were really grounded in in reality in the real world. Um, they didn't they didn't have a really huge ego um and they were there they were there to you know pass on uh practical knowledge yeah um and so uh, pretty much yes there was no there was no um high art low art sort of mentality 
right everything everything that you wanted to do was was you know uh encouraged and uh so that was that was a nice that was a nice space to to come back into and not be told that you know you can't do this you got to do that sort of thing right yeah that's cool i i i went to uh i went to a school uh, i went to scad recently about a couple years ago and uh and my 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 master's was in a kind of an interdisciplinary degree so i did I did half of it in the graphic design program and then half of it in an illustration program. And SCAD has a pretty decent sequential art, you know, program. Um, yeah. But, uh, and, and I, uh, unfortunately, just cause I was trying not to go broke, I didn't get to like kind of wander around and explore like I, I would have if it didn't cost so much. Uh, right. But I feel like, I feel like there was like a level of respect there, except for whenever I took kind of the, uh, like the art history classes or the ones that were about kind of uh, criticism, you know, that were trying to teach you to be like an art critic. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anytime I got into that, in, into that world, like the teachers that I had, they were nice, you know, and they were helpful or whatever, but just like the text and the subject matter was so dripping with this, this, I, I just felt like, the entire purpose of what they were trying to teach us was so that we could make people feel stupid at parties. Like, so that we could just like flaunt, uh, dumb things. Like, like I think we spent weeks at one point in time debating what is art, which is the stupidest question because it's unanswerable. And then you go through all of these dumb movements about, you know, people trying to make stuff that's intentionally ugly to like subvert the idea that aesthetics have to be beautiful or whatever. And it's like, this is just, it's just so stupid and pedantic. And it's like, it's like, I don't know. I hated the whole, but whenever I would just get with like, like you said, like a working artist who they're like, I illustrate for a living, you know, th this is where I go and this is what I've found. I just felt like, okay, there is a huge, massive difference between um, those that talk about art, in this kind of highbrow intellectual way uh, that's almost like these gatekeepers that use language to keep the common man out of the conversation versus somebody who's just like, I'm in the trenches and I do it. And I had so much more respect and such a better experience for those that are like, yeah, this is how it is. And this is what I was doing a couple months ago. And this is a conversation I had with a client yesterday. And it's like, it's like, it's just, it's just a job. You know, and it takes a, a huge amount of work to to be good at it, but it's still like it's not magic and it's not this like stuff that makes you better than anybody else because you can, you know, cite all kinds of random museum, you know, hoity toity garbage. Anyway, it just drove me nuts. It, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I could rant on this for a long time, but we're kind of getting <laughs> Oh, that's fun. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, no. so it's always, yeah, it's always nice to it's always nice to come across somebody else who who at least has had a similar experience because I uh, it just drives me nuts. <laughs> I hate the elitism, and I, I cut you off there. I'm sorry about that. But yeah, yeah, no, it's I mean it is it's a it's a power it's a power stance. Like if if the artists don't, uh, and again, I'm going to talk in general. Yeah, generalities, which you know I don't generally like, but <laughs> um, but uh, you know that sort of high art talk is just yeah people that want to maintain their their power within that structure so um you know painters who say that painting is more important than than drawing you know uh it's really just the fear that that they will become obsolete somehow right so they they push that agenda and you know and they they essentially brainwash young people that go into art school thinking, oh, well, this is, this is, you know, to do real art, quote unquote, real art. Um, you know, I have to do it like this, or I have to take, I have to use this medium or I have to use, you know, I have, or I have to talk about, I can't use, uh, I can't do uh, like figurative work. Like that was a big thing when I started going to school was that they were trying to take figurative, like drawing and painting out of drawing and painting and it became more theory and more, uh, you know, uh, concept. 
and that sort of thing. And, and it was just like, well, what happens if you just wanted to paint a body? Um, you know, you got looked down upon by the painters or by whoever. And it was just like, well, no one needs those sort of restrictions when you're trying to learn stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when I left art school, that's sort of where I was at. I was like, because I, because I liked comics going into art school and then they told me not to do comics, which was like, okay, okay, fine. But I already had that sort of, I want to, it's going to maybe be slightly derogatory, but I would have an illustrator sort of view uh, as opposed to a fine art sort of view. Right. But I was in the fine art section then. So they were very much uh, trying to push me into areas that I wasn't necessarily interested in. Yeah. And so I just kind of threw up my hands and said, screw this, I'm out of here. Um, and it took me a couple of years to sort of, you know, decide that uh, that art was worth it. And I would fight it, you know, I'd fight the, fight the system, I'd fight the man. Um, but by the time I went back, it was sort of a free-for-all. Like Emily Carr, I never once felt like I was being put on uh, as to what I was supposed to do. I just did what I wanted to do. Yeah. And, but I think because I had a few more years <laughs> under my belt at that point that I, I was uh, less susceptible to people pushing me around. Right. Yeah, and that helps a lot. So, um, so let me ask you this, L let me, I, I kind of want to jump around a little bit and we can kind of talk about whatever you want, but, but there's, <laughs> there's a couple, there's a couple topics that, that I'm pretty interested in. And, uh, so, so first talk about, um, talk about, let, let's talk about kill all monsters and then let's talk about, um, kind of, you have, you have kind of full tilt coming, coming out or you're planning I, on working on it soon or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll cover the full tilt thing right now. Okay, because we're kind of it's kind of dangling. But um, what full tilt is is uh is going to be uh, a story that I I'm writing that I will draw for myself. Yeah, um, and just it's it's something that I've been I've been kind of thinking about for a number of years. But it was sort of this year, uh, early this year, that I decided you know what um, I'm just going to go for it, um, and I'm going to write for myself. Uh, there's a weird sort of wall that uh, it's probably self-constructed wall, but I always felt like I was, I was, I'm an artist I'm, and I'm not a writer. So I'll just stay in my lane. And uh, at a certain point uh, earlier this year, I just thought, well, you know, <laughs> I think I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I just decided to, to, to do it. And, uh, and it, this is an idea that has been in the back of my head for a while. Um, like the story, uh, well, not so much the story, but just sort of the the overall feeling of what I wanted to do. The story I've been hammering out over the last six months or so, but um, but it was one of those things where it's just sort of it, it, it became the time to try to write something for myself that I would draw. Yeah. And so so that's what full tilt will be. And um, I was I was writing it. I was about halfway through, and then when I got uh, the chance to do the the um, Judge Dredd stuff, it's been put on the side because the Judge Dredd stuff is is full time. the 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 deadlines are have been four weeks. Yeah. Um. So I've been trying to just keep on top of that, and so uh, yeah, uh, full tilt has been ha sadly. Uh, put on hold until that's all done so yeah well sadly but at the same time like dread that's that's a huge opportunity that's pretty oh. awesome oh for sure and i am so uh i'm so stoked to be able to do this it really came down to uh, ulysses um uh you know just kind of <laughs> i don't know we're just kind of saying hey do you want to do you want to um do you want to do this and it's like oh wow yeah i can and I so and so how did that come about Oh, just chatting. Uh, I, I've known Ulysses for a while, and it was one of those things where it's like, um, I don't know why this thing, oh, there we go. Um, and it was one of those things where we've talked about doing something together, uh, but our schedules just never really lined up. Uh -huh. And um, So uh, I don't know the full, the full what, <laughs> what's what with what happened, but um, they, need, they needed somebody to step in and, and help out a little. And so originally it was, uh, 
just going to be the one issue. And then, uh, then they asked me to stay on for just a little bit longer. So that was cool. Yeah, that's way cool. And so you said it's a four week turnaround. Is that, is that like a full 22 pages or? Uh, 20. 20? Yeah. Yeah. The standard now seems to be 20 pages. Yeah. I've noticed that actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cost thing. I think, uh, you know, if they have to pay three or four people, uh, you know, if they can cut out 22 or two pages out of 22, you know, they're making a decent savings. Yeah. Having to pay those people to do it. So, um, yeah, I think it's just a cost cost thing. And, and I mean, is that, uh, are you basically doing a page a day at that speed or? Yeah. Yeah. And how, how is that? Um, how is that for you? I mean, is that, is that a comfortable pace or is that pretty breakneck or? Uh, if it was my own, like it, doing kill all monsters that it's a, that's easily doable when it's a, a licensed thing. Um, it becomes a little more, uh, you know, and this is probably more internal, but it becomes a little more difficult because I want to make sure that I stay, uh, you know, on, on model. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I do, uh, do my best job so that, you know, there's not a lot of revisions and that sort of thing. So there, I definitely, um, take a little bit more time with, uh, with, uh, you know, work for hire type stuff, uh, just due to the nature of, you know, so many people that are depending on it. Whereas if I'm doing Kill Monsters, uh, it's just me and Michael. And I don't think Michael's ever given me any, any um, editorial notes or anything. So yeah. it's one of those things where I just do it and, uh, and he likes it and, and we live with it. So, you know. Right. Yeah. And but so. Yeah. Four, so four weeks, four weeks for a work for hire uh, issue is is a little tight um but you know five weeks is probably a little more than i need so somewhere in between there I, i'm pretty i can do i can do a, an issue a month yeah um but my wife just you know loses me for a couple couple days near the end when it gets to deadline time i right. disappear for a while but yeah and and is that a is that a five-day work week or are you working seven days as much as you can or, or how does that from a schedule uh, standpoint yeah it, it's it probably works out to six um six days i, I do my five days and then on the weekends at at night time because i'm a night owl yeah so uh you know my wife and son go to bed and then uh, i'll work for another you know four hours or something mm -hmm. so over the course of the weekend i'll usually put in another day's worth so it tends to be about six six days a week yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um so so two other things, two other things. Well, oh, we haven't talked about Kill All Monsters. I got I got super excited about Dread because before <laughs> before we move on from Judge Dread, and I know I've talked to you about this on Twitter, but I want to be notified like as soon as you put pages up for sale cuz I I got to grab one of them. <laughs> I have like I have like a wall of uh I have a wall of work. I've got some uh uh, I'm, I'm trying to collect, there's kind of two things that I go for. And I think judge dread falls squarely into those categories, but I really like explosions and, and motorcycles. And, and, and I didn't notice this theme until I started picking up some stuff. And I realized that I'm picking up like Sean Gordon Murphy stuff and I'm picking, you know, like, and it's all this. And I'm like, okay, okay. And, and, and judge dread falls right into that category. So anyway, there's all right. Well, there's no, there's no motorcycles so far. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. But, but I mean, there are, uh, there are some explosions. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I mean, it's just, he's just that character. I mean, he's just got so much, it, it just exudes action. You know I mean? That's yeah. Just, so, yeah, this one, this one's interesting because, uh, I don't know if you follow the series, but, um, it's sort of dread in, uh, you know, in a Western setting. Um, interesting. Yeah, it's it, it's like uh, set in the future. It's like Meg City and stuff's all been destroyed, and uh, and then uh, and there's just sort of rebuilding society, and and so it's very like Wild West. Yeah, that's sort of the, what they're 
what they're working off of. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so it's it, it's dread, but it's not quite dread, if you know what I mean. Right, yeah. Uh, not cruising down the, the city in, on a big motorcycle or anything like that. Okay, it's cool. More, uh, yeah, it's more like on, a, on a, like a mechanical horse that has no head. And, and uh, you know, they're trying to build a train system and that sort of stuff. So the technology is very low. Um, it's a, kind of Mad Maxy. Yeah. Uh, that sort of that sort of tech. Um, not quite what you would normally think of Judge Dredd. Yeah. But it's interesting, though. You know, it's interesting. Well, that sounds cool. And you got to do stuff to mix it up. I mean, that character has been around forever. And so that's cool. That yeah. They're, they're chained it up a little bit. Yeah, there's no no point in telling the same stories over and over and over and over again. Um, you got to sometimes branch out and and try to go for it. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I, I really like what uh, what Ulysses and Eric are doing. So uh, so it was a no brainer. Like I mean, uh, dread dread is it was a is a bucket list thing for me. Yeah. Um, so it was one of those things where. Uh, yeah, you know, sign me up. <laughs> right. where, do, where, where do I? Where Where do you want me to sign? So, um, yeah, just the fact that it fell in my lap like that, you know, and and kudos to to Ulysses for uh, for asking me, and you know, I really appreciate it because it's one of those things where I never really thought I'd get a chance to do something uh, to do a dread thing. So, um, so to get the opportunity is 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 pretty awesome. Yeah, that is that's really cool. I mean, and 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 deserved though. You know, I mean, I think I think you you fit squarely into kind of I, I don't know when I when I think of when I think of Judge Dredd and I think of your style, uh, you know, it's just it, it seems to fit really well. So, well, thanks. But, yeah, but you you mentioned uh, you mentioned that you never thought you'd be able to or that the opportunity would ever come up. Um, and, and before we started recording, we were kind of talking along the lines of kind of this, uh, this doubt that seems to plague artists. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know if you've ever heard the term imposter syndrome. Have you come across that term before? Uh, it doesn't sound familiar. Okay. So I, I am like the worst with, with imposter syndrome. I didn't realize like what I was dealing with until I came across this term, but, uh, they, they claim that most most creatives are dealing with this idea that you rationalize away all of your successes um, as like happenstance or, or uh, you know, just other people or whatever, but you internalize all of your failure failures. So you like own every failure that you have, but like any, any success you say, well, that, you know, that was just like the circumstance or whatever. And, uh, and anyway, the, the irony of it is that, um, for me is that I'll be sitting in a room and I will, I'll feel like at any moment people are going to find out that I'm a fraud and, <laughs> and, and yet, and yet they say that most creatives are experiencing this. And so if I'm in a room full of creatives, most people in the room are thinking everybody in the room knows what they're doing except me. <laughs> and so so I'm wondering, and I'm not, I'm not saying that you have imposter syndrome by any means, but I have. Sure you are, you jerk. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is I have noticed that especially artists, especially ones that in particular are, um, are improving, right? And I feel like, I feel like people who don't improve, they never really get good, but the ones there, there's kind of this there's kind of this double-edged sword where if I'm going to be honest about my work, I'm going to see the flaws in it. And in seeing the flaws in it, I can make it better. Right. But also in seeing the flaws in it, I'm very aware of the flaws. Mm -hmm. And then I take those flaws and I compare them to people who have been doing this for 10 to 15 years longer than I have or something like that. And I'm comparing my worst attributes to their best work. And I just feel like, oh man, you know, I'm just garbage. And it, and this seems to be a really common thing, this kind of how we beat ourselves up. And yet it's also what helps us get better. And so I've been rambling for several minutes, but has any, anything that I'm talking about, does any of that land where you just have kind of this doubt and somehow you're able to overcome that or fight through it or 
you know, in, in well, your in your journey, how have, how have you kind of battled that? I fight that feeling every single day, every single day. Uh, most of the time, uh, I, <laughs> some of this might come come from being Canadian to, to buy into um uh, to you know stereotypes and whatever. But uh, I'm I'm Canadian and uh, we tend to be fairly um self depreciating. Uh -huh. We tend to we tend to put ourselves down a lot, um, you know, and and raise p other people up. So uh, it's something that you know is sort of cultural, but also uh, very much uh, internal for me. Um, I'm always thinking that what I'm doing is pretty much crap, <laughs> and, and you know, every once in a while I'll stop and I'll I'll smell the roses and think, wow, you know, that's pretty good. I, I really like that. Um, I could finish the page, you know, uh, put, put my, put my brush down, put my, my pen down and step away and go have a drink and talk to my wife and talk to my kid and come back to the studio, you know, an hour later and just think it's the worst piece of shit you've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and it, it, that's really hard to deal with, um, it is. knowing that at any moment, the thing that you were, you know, fairly happy with if not very happy with is now all of a sudden not worth anything and um so yeah it's a constant struggle for me yeah i i do the same thing i've started to measure i've started to measure my artistic success on how long it takes me to hate something that i've finished <laughs> <laughs> like like if i can go if i can go a day or two before i hate it that that is like a major accomplishment because usually it's exactly like what you said you like yeah, I nailed it. And then you come back a few minutes later and you're like, I am the worst. What was I thinking? And it's just, <laughs> so what do you, so what do you do? What do you do with that? I mean, do you just, do cry. you just, you cry, <laughs> get drunk? Do you I, just... I, I get into a fetal position and rock myself. <laughs> I, uh, I complain to my wife. My wife says, shut up. And, um, you know, you're not as nearly as bad as you think you are. Yeah. And I, you know, I let that sit for a while and no you know i mean <laughs> i'm being a little bit silly there but at the same time it's true um sometimes it just takes time you know like i need to just to step away from it realize that that something that i think is not very good um is actually not bad yeah and uh but that doesn't necessarily come you know overnight it doesn't come in a week sometimes it takes a couple weeks uh you know i'll turn in something that I think is pretty good, but you know, it's okay. Um, and then once, <laughs> and I'm notorious for this, I'll turn something into an editor. Um, that I'm, that I'm, you know, like, okay, this is, this is good. I like this. And it, I swear to God within about an hour of uploading it to the FTP, um, I'll want to be making changes. Yeah. I'll be like, Oh wait, that guy's arm is not quite right. Or, Oh, that guy's face is just not right. And I will email them and say, don't use those files. I'm fixing these things. <laughs> I'm going to upload the new ones, uh, you know, in like an hour. Uh, and, and the differences are so small. Like what I'm changing is so small. And half the time they don't even realize that I've changed stuff. And, and I started to think to myself, well, <laughs> why do I put myself through this? Like, yeah. why not just accept and move on, accept and move on. Don't, you know, I, I constantly look back and think, Oh, how can I make this better? How can I make that better? And, and it's, it's pretty detrimental at a certain level anyways. Yeah. I mean, I understand not being happy with your stuff helps or, you know, me not being happy with my own stuff helps me uh, get better right. and, and to, you know, to struggle through, through stuff. Um, I, I totally agree that if you, if you aren't finding problems in your drawing, you're probably getting really lazy and, um, you know, you're not progressing. Yeah. Or you're um, just, or you're just a jerk. <laughs> like, <laughs> or you're just really good. <laughs> that's and, true. That's true as well. But I've noticed, I've noticed that most people that are really good, uh, are still very aware that they can improve. It's the people who never get any better and are just cocky as all get out. <laughs> and it's like, it's like, your stuff looks the same as it did a couple of years ago. And you're not, you know, you're not as great as you think you are. 
you know, it's it's the amateurs that that demand, you know, recognition or whatever that are like, eh, I don't know, man, I, I don't with without that. And, and, and I don't know, maybe this is just my own psychosis, but without that, like internal battle going on and at least recognizing that there's room for improvement, I just don't see how you could get it any better. Yeah, no, I, I do agree with that. I think, I think that at a certain level, you need to be uh, unhappy with your work at some point. Um, otherwise, yeah, you're just, you're just going through the motions or regurgitating the same thing. Like, Oh, you know, I draw creatures like this or, Oh, I, right. I draw, I draw a horse from this angle really well. So I'll just keep drawing a horse from that angle really well. You know, yeah. there's no point in doing that over and over and over again after a while. Like I understand uh, time constraints. I understand being on a, you know, the, um, you know, you're, you're on a deadline. You got to get stuff done. I understand that fully. Yeah. But you know, at a certain point when every, when every gig uh, is, is, you know, pretty much the same thing over and over again. Yeah. You know, that's the point where somebody has got to step in and kind of just say, Hey, maybe you should, you know, take a break and, and try to do something different for a little while. But that's, you know, that's a hard, that's a hard thing to do because we don't get paid a lot of money in the first place. So yeah, uh, I understand the paycheck thing for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. But it's one of those guys like, so we were talking, I was talking about Byrne, John Byrne about how, you know, how ingrained he was in me and, you know, he's a guy and I don't want to crap all over him because he is super talented. Like I even just looked at some stuff that was put out maybe, I don't know, four or five years ago. Uh -huh. uh, super talented, but it hasn't progressed at all in probably 25 years. Yeah. Like he draws the same downshot angles. He uses the same technology. He uses the same facial features. He uses the same hair. He uses, and it's just like, like he does it really well. Right. But it, it, he's not pushing anything, and he's not – he's not. It's, I mean, this is me coming – who am I, right? But um, I just – I don't feel like there's any sort of inquiry in drawing. It's it's definitely – to him, it's just a paycheck. You know, I got I to gotta make this issue, uh, you know, 22 pages, and I got to make it in four weeks. Here it is. Right. And it, and it never really feels like he's he, – he's, looked at his work and said, you know what? I'm not happy with this. I want to push this. It, it, it doesn't feel like that is being said, you know, anywhere near him. No one wants to tell him that or whatever. Right. Which is a shame because I think that he is an amazing, uh, an amazing artist, but it doesn't feel like he's decided that, uh, you know, progressing is something that he's interested in. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, Along along those lines, uh, I want to I want to jump back and and I want to talk about composition. Um, so as as you're as you're roughing these out, um, and and we've been watching you do this uh, on this page as you've been kind of tightening things up. Um, do you? How much of it is a conscious decision um, from like a compositional standpoint? I mean, we talk about like camera or whatever, but but like how much? how much of like your shot selection and uh, your composition is just intuitive because you just feel comfortable doing it or how much of it is you're following specific rules or you make a conscious decision or you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, I think, I think it's probably 50, 50. Um, there are definitely rules that, uh, that I consider all the time. Uh, one of them is the the rule of thirds. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really always conscious of something like that, you know, trying to set up that sort of so that it, the thing that you're looking at isn't necessarily right in the middle, right, of the of the panel. Uh, that's something that I'm pretty conscious of most of the time. Um, and, you know, unless that's a specific thing that you're going for, right? If you want if you want to unsettle unsettle people, you know, doing dead centers you know, is going to do that because it breaks that rule. Yeah. Right. I think, I think that, uh, I tend to, I, te I do tend to, um, think mostly in terms of the third, um, uh, now, yeah. 
Now, I think you, a lot of it's just I, I start making uh, well, one of the other things too that doing comics, you have to really be conscious of the of the words, right? You know, like how much space uh, the words are going to take up, because you know you maybe you maybe have a square, um, and you think, oh, I want to set it up like this, but if there's a whole lot of words, then you know you're going to lose. You, you know, you can't see my hands because but you might lose. Like if there was a lot of words, you might lose that much, right? So I would have to right. push everything down the, down the page or down the panel so that you 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 could see stuff so you know looking i'm always conscious of how how much space i need to leave for the words and then once i do that then i kind of compose around that so you start at least in your mind with kind of an idea of how much dialogue is is going on in each panel and work from there uh definitely i think yeah. the the first two things i really think about are whether it's uh, more of a, a horizontal um, sort of panel, like if the action is more of a horizontal thing mm -hmm. or more, more of a vertical thing, I'll think in those terms. And then also, yeah, the amount of space I need to leave for, uh, for words or sound effects or, or if it's asking for something, you know, if it's asking for uh, very specific things, like something happening in the background that, you know, pays off in the next panel or whatever, Right. You know, that has to be planned. It can't, it can't just sort of happen. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll place, I'll generally place some of the things that, that need to happen or need to be seen. Uh, I'll place them first and, and then kind of work around that. But it's a really fluid sort of way that I work. Um, the roughs that I do um, are, like I say, are tend to be big blobby things. Uh, that's I'm in the wrong dread file. Um, you know, uh, but I, but I mean, working that way, uh, I think is important from a compositional standpoint because, I mean, in that top panel, for example, like that works, and you read or the one that you just had up. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. Um, but the one that the one that you just had up. It reads, even though, even though, as you described it, it's kind of blobby, like I can tell what's going on. Like from a compositional standpoint, I mean, you have, you've got perspective, you've got a crowd of people there. You can tell somebody's on their knees. And so if it can read in a, in its simplest form, then as you kind of uh, add detail to it and draw out, you know, the drawing, you're not going to lose that. Or at least you hope you're not going to lose it. But I mean... That that's important because I feel like a lot of people, at least when they start, are so fixated on, you know, the detail and showing off and everything that they miss sometimes, uh, you know, the composition of the panel, the composition of the page. And yeah. So, and so, kind of working in the in the way that you're doing is is a, I mean, if it if it works with a giant blobby brush and single color, then it, it'll it'll almost work no matter what else you do to it as long as you don't as long as you follow that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, that's also one thing I guess I should probably say is I, I'm always thinking in terms of clear storytelling. Yeah. Um, I want my job as a, as a comic book artist is to make sure that people understand what's happening. Uh, you know, even on a level where if there was no words, uh, they should have a, a decent understanding of what's, what's sort of going on. Right. Um, so when I when I go to start doing a page, you know I'm really conscious of the like I said the, the specific things that are in a panel that need to be seen. Um, I want to make sure that 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 stuff uh, you know reads properly, uh, and I'm not so worried uh, about flashy stuff, um, which is probably one reason why I'm not the the suit de jour because um, <laughs> my my pages don't tend to be flashy at all. They're pretty pedestrian, which is kind of a bad thing to say. But, um, you know, you generally know what's happening all the time. You, you, people don't tend to get lost when they read something that I've drawn. Right. And well, and I feel like, I, I, I don't know, I feel like putting that, putting down, you know, what you're doing as pedestrian is, is probably not accurate because I think one of the worst things that can happen is, and I've heard this term and it's a gross term, but just visual masturbation where it's like, <laughs> I've, I've just, you know, you have, you have an artist that's like, Oh, I'm going to do this amazing thing, but it like, it doesn't serve the story or it, it confuses, 
even worse, it confuses the narrative. And it's like, well, yeah, that single panel or that one pose or whatever you've done there, it might look amazing, but like, it, it, if it takes you out of the story and you get, get get confused and you have to stop and like figure out which panel is next or where the flow of the page is going or whatever, like, yeah, you've shown off and you know, you've done a cool looking pinup, but it doesn't serve the story, which is the point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm in full agreement. It's always been my, like I say, it's always been sort of my ideal to make sure that I'm telling the story um well with with pictures yeah and not relying heavily on um on the words to make sure people understand what's going on right you know as i will say that i'm sure at some point uh i fail but it's at least something that i'm conscious of all the time and uh and i hope that you know that i don't fail as often as 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 i'm not aware <laughs> right yeah. So, um, so take me through, uh, we, we've been doing this for a while and I don't want to, I don't want to keep you all night. Um, no. and this has been super awesome, but, uh, so take me through, take me through the kill all monsters omnibus. What, what's going on? What's going on with that? And how can people kind of get a hold of it and whatnot? Oh, uh, okay. Well, um, well, the book is, um, the book's coming out through dark horse. Uh-huh. It's a giant robots versus giant monster book. It's uh, Michael and, and my little uh, love letter to to Godzilla and and uh, and that sort of genre. We're not super steeped in the whole um, kaiju history. We're yeah. probably more pedestrians or visitors <laughs> more than uh, than people that really know their stuff. But um, it's definitely. Uh, uh, a book that both of us are really love doing. It's uh, it's something that uh, that hopefully we get to keep doing. And um, yeah, it's just sort of a it's a fun book. It, you know, it's there's, there's there's a serious story in there, um, but it's not. It doesn't take itself super serious. So um, it's one of those things where I think Michael's written a story that touches on a number of things. Um, uh, but not heavy, not heavy handedly. Uh, yeah. you know, and, um, and with a little bit of a, a wink and a smile and, uh, and yeah, I think, I think it's just, it's a really nice, it's just a really nice balance of, uh, of material. Yeah. And, and one thing I, cause I, I would, I would fall into a similar category where I enjoy the, the kind of giant robots or giant Mac fighting giant monsters or whatever but i you know i i don't like sit down and watch all the godzillas back to back in a big marathon or whatever um but like i i think it's a fun genre and but one thing i've noticed um and i wanted to ask you about this uh is it it feels it feels very much like a nod towards um that whole genre you know but it doesn't feel like a ripoff of it like in your in your character designs of uh, the robots and the character designs of the of the monsters, they feel like they belong there, but it's not like, oh yeah, there's your there's your Mothra monster and there's your Godzilla monster and there's your this robot or whatever. Um, and so, how did you in, in something where you've got decades of history and hundreds of characters that are very well established? How do you go about creating, um, you know? recognizable shapes that you're able to like move and play with without just being a ripoff. How, how did you do that from a character design standpoint? I, I was super interested in that as I, cause I have volume one yeah, and, and I reread it uh, last week. And, uh, and that's what really jumped out at me is like, you know, this feels like, you know, I can see elements of, of different uh, characters, but not, not in a way where it's like, Oh, I see that you've taken the arm from this guy and the head from this guy and kind of cobbled them together. It, it just feels like it belongs in that world, but not as a ripoff. So, what did what did you do? Take me take me through kind of your process of of character design for Kill All Monsters. Well, I'm just trying to see if I can find any old files that uh, that kind of show. I know that I've I've got um, I know that I've got uh, 
a bunch of stuff. I just don't remember where I put it. Um, well, mostly like designing designing the robots. Um, I actually heavily referenced or influenced by a um, a Marvel comic series from the late seventies, early eighties called the Shogun Warriors. Okay. Uh, it was a twenty issue run. Um, uh, that uh, that was based on toys. And I actually owned the toys before I owned the comic. So when I saw the comic, it was like a no-brainer to buy the comic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the toys were like two and a half feet tall uh, robots that actually fired missiles and fists and and stuff. And um, Those are huge. Yeah. And, and so and it, those toys were some of the toys that, that prompted uh, safety measures so that the missiles couldn't actually come out <laughs> because kids were pointing them at their you know siblings or whatever and shooting them down their throat and all this sort of stuff. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, because they were spring loaded and these these things really flew. So, um, but yeah, and then the comic came out and I was just like, wow, this is awesome. So I own, I still own all the comics and uh, and so from a really young age that their aesthetic, the 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 robots from uh, Shogun Warriors, that aesthetic was something that really spoke to me. And so designing the 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 mech for for kill all monsters, I I started I started kind of doing uh, something that was probably a little more uh, I would say like like maybe like Robotech-y, a mm-hmm. little more a little more uh, Japanimation feel to them, but I just wasn't really digging it because it's not really where I come from. Yeah, and so I kind of shifted gears and I started making them a lot more blocky. And a lot and simplified and simplified a lot of the you know the s- different facets on their on their shoulder pads and all the sort of stuff i, I kind of stripped it all down and so um so when i was developing there essentially he uh michael would give me uh he gave me names he gave me three names mm-hmm. of of a general starting point he called one skull bot he called one lion bot and he called one stork bot Oh, interesting. And, uh, yeah, and so I just said, "Well, stork, I'll give it long legs." And yeah, I was trying to figure out how to put wings on it and stuff, and <laughs> ended up with these weird triangular things that are really hard to draw from certain angles. And <laughs> um, but you know, it just the silhouette. I would work. I w- would work on a silhouette. Um, let's see if I kind of what I was doing before at the beginning, um, where I would just. Um, where I would just block stuff in. So I get like a big, big fat brush, you know, and I would just sort of like body, head, arms, you know, oh, we want a wide stance on legs with big feet. And I would just kind of take that, you know, um, it's like, oh, heavy. take that and, and, you know, change it, change the opacity, put a layer on it. Um, Get in close, closer, you know, decide that, you know, that the knees would be bigger, that the, that the, you know, the pelvis would be like this, whatever, right? Yeah. And I would just sort of build, and then I would take that, and I'd gray it out, and I'd put a layer over it, and I would just slowly move stuff around. Or or if I took, if I had a silhouette that I thought was kind of cool, you know, you can just take like a, like take a, take a tool, and say, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna transform it, and you just, you know, you can, you just kind of play with it, yeah. You know? And then, and then it's it's a shape, and you kind of like, oh, and you know, this doesn't look like anything because I don't really know what I'm doing. But um, but what happens is you end up kind of with a shape that is interesting, and then you just put a layer over it, and you just start making making things things like you know a leg or a hand or an arm or or whatever, mm. and. Uh, so that's sort of what the, was my process was I would, I kind of had shapes and then I just kind of started adding little details and, um, you know, I'm just kind of working from those, those shapes that I found interesting. So, um, yeah, it's, it was an interesting way to work. Uh, it was kind of new to me at the time because, um, uh, I found a, <laughs> a, a tutorial on YouTube about design characters mm-hmm. that actually never really, I never really designed characters for myself. It was always, you know, 
mimicking like a, a superhero design sort of thing like you right. know design a costume sure but uh, a fundamental design of of a shape um i've never really had to deal with that so it was sort of a process that was new to me but it was really interesting and uh and i think you know i came up with some some interesting <laughs> characters and the monsters were the same you know i would i would just work from shapes and um yeah. And again, it would, it, Michael would give me, uh, he wouldn't even really give me a description sometimes. Uh, he would just say, oh, the monster needs to have tentacles or it needs to be able to run fast or it has to have no eyes or whatever. Uh -huh. um, and I would just sort of go from there. Um, we did, <laughs> we did a, a, a pitch for it a long time ago, like before it was a webcomic and all that. And we sent it out to a few, um, publishers and one of them one of the publishers uh i won't say who his name is but he was very blunt and he said that my monster designs back then my monster designs just look like um uh dudes with funny heads um like they're very uh you know a uh, humanoid shaped uh pretty much in proportion with what a, what a you know a human looks like and then the head would be different or it would have claws or whatever and and i you know, after a bit of rejection and all that sort of stuff, we, we decided that we would, you know, retool it and, and th rethink it. Um, and that's sort of when I, we, we updated the story, the story moved from it being so far in the past, we jumped it into the future a bit. And, um, and then it gave me an opportunity to sort of, you know, reestablish what, what the visual, um, you know, what the designs would be like, what, how we were going to do it. Cause it was in color it, it was um, in like regular comic format, like it was portrait, not landscape. Yeah. Um, so it was a totally different beast. And so when we when we got our rejections, we kind of just stepped back, and uh, and then that's when I started doing the the monster designs were were all way way further away from from just a humanoid shape sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. And so, did you do the did you do the landscape be, because of the web? I mean, were you doing that intentionally yep. to be a web comic there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because uh, after after we got rejections and all that sort of stuff, Michael Michael and I kind of just decided that you know we were going to do it anyways. Yeah. Uh, and, and which I I I really I really pride I take a lot of pride in the fact that we we kind of pushed through all of the negativity um, and just decided, you know, we enjoy doing this and this is what we're going to do. And, uh, and we stuck with it. And so, yeah, so it was like, well, neither of us are rich. We don't really feel like, and this was a little bit before Kickstarter was anything. Yeah. Um, and it was just like, well, you know, there's no real way to finance this. Uh, so what, let's just do it and put it on the web. And, uh, and so that's what we did. And, and the, Mainly the reason why it's landscape uh, is because I I always hated reading uh, uh, web comics that were portrait because right. you had to scroll, and I just I didn't like scrolling to read my comic, and so it was just like well if we just cut the page in half like an actual uh, page in half you know it reads uh, landscape and it reads on screen great and uh, and there you go. So that's what we did. We just decided that landscape was the way to go. And then once you've done 80 pages, you can't really turn back from that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden you're just going to switch yeah, for it. It is what it is now. So, uh, so yeah. So, um, yeah. And then once we had about 80 pages, uh, I, I managed to, um, get a few gigs here and there. So Kill Monsters went on the back burner for a little while. And then I just kind of decided, you know, I started doing shows and, I just, I needed, I needed a book yeah. uh, put on the table. So I just told Michael, you know, let, let's finish up the first half of this and, uh, and we'll do a Kickstarter. So, so Michael wrote it up and I barreled through and then we did the Kickstarter. Uh, it was like four years ago now. And, um, and we did really well and that financed the printing of the book. And we uh, we t teamed up with Alterna Comics, and they got us into comic stores. And um, yeah, and and so and from from that, 
and this is one of the reasons why I'm really proud that we stuck with it. Uh, having the trade on my on my table when I was um, I was at C2E2, and you know uh, a guy came by and he was looking through my stuff and he was like, "Oh, I really like this," and he's thumbing through it. And we're just chatting, and then uh, at the end of the <laughs> the end of the discussion, he was like, "Well, uh, you know." if you ever have anything that you want to pitch, you can, you can send it to me. And, and I was like, Oh, uh, who are you? <laughs> and it is Dave Marshall, uh, an editor at, at dark horse. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, and I was just like, Oh my God, I've just been chatting with a, a, a senior editor and, <laughs> and I had no idea, which is really good that I didn't. Um, so it was kill All monsters that he, that was the book that he sort of picked up and was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, so, you know, uh, I was working with uh, Kurt Pierce um, doing, um, we, we were putting the pop thing together. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so because Dave kind of gave me an open door to pitch, pitched and pop, he, you know, Dark Horse picked that up. And then, uh, and then Kurt started doing the Tomorrows. So I did an issue of that. And when I was finishing the issue of Tomorrows, I just kind of said, hey, Dave, what do you think about, or of course, putting out a Kill a Monster book, and I, I was—I mean, I wanted—I—I I was semi-confident, but at the same time, I'm like, oh, there's no way they're going to do it. Um, and he came back almost right away. I was like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Um, and it's like, not only do does does um, Mike Richardson not only does he want to do it, but why don't we do a Dark Horse present story as well to kind of you know introduce the the property to to the more mainstream readers. Yeah. So we ended up doing a Dark Horse Present story, a Kill a Monster story. And uh, yeah, and so it was just like this weird snowball of events that, you know, if we didn't stick with it, uh, you know, we never would have had this book, which, you know, I didn't really think about until, uh, you know, I started doing a lot of more interviews and stuff where I realized, you know, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the fact that we, we didn't take the rejection and just let it die. Um, yeah. You know, we really stuck with it. Yeah. And I, and I feel like, I, I don't know, like all the time, all the time people are asking like, you know, how do I break in or whatever? And, and I not having broken in at all. So, you know, but I just watch from the outside uh, and everybody always says, well, this is how I did it. But like, that's not going to work for you because it's different. But, but the, the common thread is go make stuff no matter what happens, like, and, and finish it and put it out there, you know, like. Yeah. You know, if you want to be in comics, go make comics and then you're in comics, you know, like you you don't need anybody's permission, you know, like success will come or it won't later, you know, but, but you don't like, I've never, I've never even heard of anybody, um, like showing up and being like, Hey, look, I'm amazing, but I've never made anything. And then having people go, Oh, excellent. Let me sign you on, you know, to, to do this or that or the other thing. It's like, you know, I mean, I think that was happening a little bit in the nineties, but, but I mean, for, for the, for the most part, uh, nowadays, like this is how you do it, you know? And, and looking back at your story, it seems super obvious at the time though. It's like, everybody's telling, you, no, uh, you're getting all this negative feedback and whatever. And then lo and behold, like years later, (laughs) that is the Genesis of, you know, your, your current career and you're drawing like recognizable properties and you're, you know, you're being invited to do stuff. And it's because, you know, you, you finish something yeah. regardless of, regardless of the feedback that you were getting, you made it and you did it and then you finish it and you showed people. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think that there, yeah, it's like any industry, I guess is what, um, you know, pe- a lot, there's always a lot of talk, but it's the people that actually do, that um that that move forward and um i've always uh, you know i've always thought uh finishing something and getting it out there was was you know really important yeah and uh so yeah my advice has always been just do the work um you know lots of people think you know it's super difficult to to do comics and you know it is super difficult to do comics um but if you really want to do comics, then do comics. <laughs> yeah. Um, because there's not a lot of money in it anyways. You know, even when you're, uh, um, this is not me, but you know, even when you're, you're, you're doing all right. Yeah. Um, 
it's still, you know, you look around at what other people are making in other industries and it's really not that much money. And, uh, you know, so to be shooting for, for like a living, um, it's probably not the, the career you want to get into. You, you have to love to draw comics. And if you love to draw comics, then you're going to draw comics, whether somebody's going to pay you or not. Yeah. And, um, and that's the way that you will get better. And you'll, you know, you'll make a name for yourself is just by doing. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of people think that they're going to do a pitch with somebody and, you know, and it does happen, but not very often, not, not very often where they'll do a pitch, they'll work on pitch pages after pitch pages, after pitch pages, different writer, different writer, whatever, you know, and they, once they've done 10, 15, 20 pitches, you know, they've done a hundred pages of comic, but they don't have a comic. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's like, well, if you just took that energy and that time and you did a 200 page comic, you would have this book that you could show people. Yeah. Um, you know, and if whether it's successful or not, it doesn't really matter. You've got a book, but you can't really show them 20, you know, sets of five page pitches. Like, yeah, that, that won't, that won't entertain anyone. So you know, I understand wanting to swing for the swing for the fence there, but sometimes you just got to sit down and, and do a short story and publish it on the web, do another short story, publish it on the web, do five or six of those, put them in a, in a one book and kickstart it, you know, yeah, um, and just, just get stuff out there. That's really what it's all about. Yeah. Oh, you're singing my song, man. <laughs> singing my song. Uh, not I. I have. <laughs> I, I'm the wrong person to talk to about this. I don't know. I keep telling myself that I just started. Uh, like in, I mean, I really started drawing in like 2012. So I can't beat myself up too much. But, but, uh, but yeah. I mean, I I intentionally chose comics to teach myself how to draw because I think it is the most drawing in the most difficult uh, situation in a huge time crunch. You know, maybe maybe on par with with like traditional animation, but it's like, I mean, the amount of drawings that you have to do per page is huge. And so I I got into about sixty pages into this comic, um, and then and then I had to I had to do some stuff with my with my day job, and and it I had to put it on pause, put it on hold. But um, and now I look back, and it's it's been a few years, and it's it's pretty garbage. <laughs> like, cause I was, I was using it to learn. So I was using it to cut my teeth and, and it's, uh, it's hard to look at now, but, um, stick around to the end. but yeah, I mean, uh, like having a project and doing a project, that's right, how you, because, that's how you do uh, everything. I mean, that's how you succeed. That's how you learn. That's how you like, subjects, but if you just is, piecemeal stuff, um, you have to, you know, make or, you or worse you than that are the people who do the work almost demand or expect you. or and, feel uh, entitled exactly to an opportunity Jason before they do that. Is, and it's like, they were told it's like no, no one owes you anything. Over over like they you've got to, you've got to build it. Again by and the, like the democratization of, and they retooled it, and you know, the death of the anyway, gatekeepers, and they it on the web and they you know, it, and, it was and in comics, there are still some gatekeepers, but at the same time, completely launched like career. you guys are proof so, that, uh, we talk okay, so every, all the gatekeepers said no, and, and so and, uh, just, publish just it online and then kickstart it, totally and, it. and then all of a sudden it's a thing. Like you, you made it happen regardless of whether or not you had permission from, you know, the, the quote unquote powers that be or whatever. Yeah. And, and anybody can do that. There's no one that can stop you from from doing that process other than yourself. No. So, yeah, no, uh, you know, time and money, um, you know, there's always factors, but sure. But I think that, um, the people who are passionate about making comics will always find a way to make them. Um, yeah, it's one of those things where, yeah, it's just, there's a lot of talk and not enough action from a lot of people that say they want to be comic book people, right. you know, um, and all I can really ever suggest is just, you know, do the work yeah. and everything else will follow. So, um, yeah, it's one of those things where I think that, uh, that people just <laughs> are a little bit, uh, lazy. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's way easier to talk about it than actually to sit down for hundreds or even thousands of hours and, and make it happen. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah so, for sure. yeah. 
and I think, I th and you know, going back to like you know the mental part of doing comics um, is you know a fear of failure. I, you know, I've got a huge fear of failure, and the idea of like going and putting yourself out there, um, you know, putting all this time, all this effort into something that people might just crap all over. Yeah. Uh, you know, it can, I, I, it can realistically uh, keep people from doing it. Um, and so, you know, it's just something that I understand that it's not, that it's not as easy, maybe not as easy as we're saying it is. Uh, but I think that, um, I think that people, you know, have a certain level of expectation uh you know or maybe say i'm going to make it by a certain age or whatever right uh, and it it's such a it's such a strange uh art form uh in itself and and to put to put so so much um you know so much pressure and 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 that sort of thing on on yourself is, is pretty unrealistic yeah but it's hard to tell people that yeah well, and and they'll figure it out or they won't. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, this this has been awesome. Um, so where uh, where can people find find your stuff and find you online? And um, yeah. Well, I'm on uh, I'm on the Twitters. Uh, just at Jason Copeland. Okay. There's no E in Copeland for for those people that uh, haven't seen it written down. Um, but yeah, uh, at Jason Copeland for Twitter, and I'm also Jason Copeland on Instagram, and I'm Jason Copeland on Facebook. Cool. I have uh, I have a website, jasoncopeland.com, but I have actually uh, lost uh, the ability to get into the back door. Oh no! Yeah, I changed my computer, and I lost the e like the email that it would send the new password to. Yeah, with old email address and blah blah blah. So. Yeah, it's just sitting there. I haven't updated in like two years. Um, I'll have to figure out how to get in and change that at some point. Yeah. But uh, I do have a website, but the information on it is very old. Okay. Well, I'll throw your I'll throw your social media links uh, in the description of this video. So if anybody wants to find you, they can uh, they can just click on that stuff and it'll take you right there. Awesome. Well, thanks, man. And uh, and for those of you that have made it this far, um, make sure to. I, this is super fun for me. Hopefully, other people are enjoying it as well. But uh, I, I had a blast. Um, but yeah, those of you that have uh, have have listened in this far, um, make sure to check out uh, Kill All Monsters and um, and Jason. If you'll give me the if you'll give me the diamond code, I will place that in there too. You can go to your. A local comic book store and uh, and have them pre-order it. Um, or if you were like me and you are in an area that does not have a local comic book store, um, you can jump on Amazon uh, and pre-order it there. Um, but uh, but you should check it out because it's a uh, volume one is awesome. I'm excited to see the rest of it, and it's a, it's a fun book. and And I'm super stoked to see uh, to see Dread and what you're doing with that. That'll be cool too. So. Yeah. Well, and thanks. Sorry, yeah. you were gonna say. Something. Oh, just that the the book is is uh it's right now it's super cheap on Amazon, and it's the book is three hundred and sixty odd pages long. It's hardcover. Yeah. And and it's like currently seventeen dollars on Amazon. So. Yeah, and everybody should order it now. Uh, I, yeah, I get on. I, I do this because I'm I'm cheap, but also. Like if you if you pre-order a book and I've pre-ordered books like a year in advance. Like uh, if you pre-order a book on Amazon, um, it will uh, you will get the lowest price from the time that you place your pre-order to the time that it ships. Like no matter what, and uh, and sometimes it'll save you fifteen cents, but sometimes it saves you some significant money. Yeah. And so uh, so get your. There's no reason to wait. Like don't wait on it. Pre-order it like right now as you're listening to this. Open up a new tab. Pre-order it. And you will literally get the best price on the book, and and it's and it's worth it. And I can't even imagine like three hundred pages, dude. Is yeah, it's just so much work. <laughs> it's, it's just amazing. So anyway, yeah, jump on there and do that. Um, well, that's great. Uh, hang hang tight for just a minute, and and we'll kind of just wrap this up. But uh, so uh, so this has been LO Talk, and I'm Corey Kerr, and you can find Jason Copeland's stuff uh, in the description of this video. So check that out. 
You can always find my stuff at CoreyKerr.com, and I'm also on Twitter and Instagram, and all of those links are also in the description of this video. Um, and so thanks for watching. I'm going to do more of these interviews um, as I come across people that are willing to talk to me uh, at this hour of night, and uh, we'll catch you guys later. So we're out. All right. Thanks. Hello Talk Interviews.